Time to shine today, podcast varsity squad. This is Scott Ferguson, and I got my boy from the Mitten. And my subscribers, you know, know out there that we're from the Mitten, which is Michigan. And it's kind of like we can talk a little smack about Michigan, but nobody else can. So this is right. my homeboy. He relocated out to the left coast, and he's enjoying that warm weather year round, kind of like I did here in South Florida. But we will always have roots in the Mitten. And I'm so blessed to bring on. My good friend, Michael Sieber, you know, he's learned that he's valued authenticity, growth, spirituality, wellness, and power, and how important each one is to him. You know, his areas of expertise include executive leadership, personal branding, change management, organizational effectiveness, employee engagement, and emotional intelligence. He's a graduate and former director of career management alumni services at Thunderbird School of Global Management and director of sourcing Talent acquisition for Banner Health Managing Department, budget of more than $1 million. And Seaver, Michael, thank you for coming on the show. Please introduce yourself to the Time to Shine Today Varsity Squad. But first, what's your favorite color and why? My favorite color is blue. All right. And why is that, my man? Because the psychology of color is so interesting to me. Like, I like to figure out, like, what do they all mean? Yes. But blue means trustworthiness. It means confidence. Yes. It means integrity. Yes. It means it means the capacity to be able to like be resilient and persistent through something. So blue has been a staple for me for a long time. And it's in your color wheel, my handsome friend. You know, you can you can rock it. You know, that's what everyone <laughs> says. Wear blue, wear blue. But no, no, I'm the for real man. So let's get a little bit into the origins. It seemed like you did a lot of soul seeking, soul searching, for lack of a better term, up to yeah. and now where you leveled up to where you are now. If we can start there, a little origins, brother. Yeah. So you know, both you and I being from the from the mitten right there's something about you know that environment or, or that place and i was raised there i used to cut grass and shovel dirt for a living from age 12 until 24 the family's landscaping and lawn maintenance business oh, that's what okay. i did so that was my thing so then in 2004 i moved to metro phoenix and started working in the hospitality industry and so if you've ever been to a four seasons i can deliver the finest in four seasons experience because i got to work there for a number of years <laughs> it was awesome but after doing that for about four years, I went to the Thunderbird School of Global Management, which you just referenced. And that was a tremendous experience because I learned to speak Mandarin Chinese. I got to travel across the world, probably not as much as you and the stuff that you've done, Scott. But that trip, you know, those trips really, really helped me. And then went to Banner Health and did some talent sourcing work there in HR, which gave me some good context about what it means to work inside of a corporation. But then in late 2011, I just got so fed up with making everybody else a bunch of money that I decided to start my own business and make my own money. Right? right. So for the last 10 years, executive coaching, team training, uh, doing lots of public presentations, writing books, it has been a wild ride, but I've loved every minute of it. You know, you said four seasons and I've stayed at a few. I've been blessed to be able to stay a few. I mean, it's like, man, it, they, they asked me questions even before I stayed there. Like, what do you like to drink? What is this, this and this? So at the time I got there, my, my mini fridge or whatever it is, it was stocked. You know, everything was it. It was so, so you took that experience of that, you know, we'll just say the, the hospitality management and you rolled it over. You can't have a better background really to start fantastic. what you're doing, right? Oh my gosh. So the, the, you are so spot on Scott in that when you work at a place like the Ritz or the Four Seasons or one of those higher end brands, yeah. it's all about anticipating what the guest needs. That's the game. And so whenever we knew that one of our guests would be going to some sort of an event, maybe they were playing a round of golf or they were going to go watch some sort of a theatric performance, we could forecast about what time they would be coming back to their room. So we would always have something waiting in the room for them upon their arrival when they were done. And so for me today as a coach or as, you know, working as a consultant, I'm always trying to think three, four, five steps ahead to be able to forecast what it is that someone might need so I can get them to the end goal faster. That you just parlayed that right into my question, man. So I really appreciate that. So <laughs> when you're going through a discovery period, when you're bringing clients in, what is your kind of secret sauce? I think you might just answer. Would, would you, if you don't mind sharing some of your secret sauce and helping them find their blind spots? Yeah. It, so for me, I try to turn the clock back a little bit. So there's a, a guy named Dr. Bruce Lipton. And so he studies brain waves. And so maybe you've talked about him before on one of your previous episodes, mm -hmm. but when I thought about how is it that from birth until age six, everything that we're learning subconsciously kind of gets baked, right? Everything we see in the environment gets baked into our subconscious. Right. And then we think about, and we just basically repeat those things day after day after day when we're in a different brainwave state. So when I really started to think about how could I be a great coach, how could I be a great consultant? How could I be somebody that really unlocks potential, like really meaningfully? 
I wanted to go back to the basics to when we were kids and think about what is it that we learned at that time in our life that we unknowingly subconsciously repeat in a way that yes. doesn't genuinely help us. Right. right. And so when I started to figure that out, I was able to get the, to the point of change inside my clients or my organizations faster. You know, it's funny you say that because, you know, a lot of the things that you're baked in, I mean, it's literally Lipton will tell you that it's literally carved into your brain waves. Like yeah. literally you might, th- we might call it subconscious and conscious, <laughs> but it's literally sh- carved in kind of like Shad Helmsteller said in what to say when you talk to yourself that parents, you know, say no to their children 135,000 times by the time they're 13. You know yes. what I'm saying? So yeah. that is what you're kind of talking about how that's really carved in. Right. Yeah. So what is some of the stuff that you might do to help, uncarve that if yeah. you will and then because we know that the conscious brain or conscious is the gatekeeper of the subconscious so what are you doing really to you do those reps brother yeah thank you so subconscious processes 400 billion bits of information per second but the conscious mind processes 2000 per second right think about <laughs> the difference of that and so what i'm doing is there's a number of things right but what we really want to make sure that we're doing is coming back to the basics of the person recognizing what it was that they learned from their environment when they were from birth until age six. So they have to have talk to family, they have to talk to friends, they have to do some reflection, like whatever that is, we got to go back and recognize what it is that they were taught via their parents then. Then we can start to figure out a way to identify patterns in their behavior today. And sometimes I would do that through a gratitude journal, or sometimes I would do that through a pain journal, right? Having them recognize those moments they feel sad or mad. And then inside those patterns is where we can get to a really distinct place. Dude. Uh, of being yeah. able to change behavior. Hell yes, man. You're digging in from a place of service and you're making them do the work. You're kind of like, you know, I, I hate to use Belichick, but you know, I mean, he did put some good teams on the field, but didn't play the game. Like, right. right? You know what I'm saying? It's like the, you, you guide, you're a coach more than a consultant, in my yeah. opinion. You know what yeah. I'm saying? You're like, they're letting them play. They're letting them get on the field, but you're giving them the playbook in a sense by say, here's a pain journal. Here's a gratitude journal and getting it yep. done. That, yep. that, that's awesome, Michael. So when you're starting to work with somebody and we're still kind of in the discovery period, is there any good question that you wish that they would ask you, but never do? Hmm. I think one of the things that we don't, they are not yet conditioned, right? Society conditions us away from this, yes. but what I, what I think about a lot or what I would hope that people would ask me more about is our core values. And you referenced it a minute ago, Scott, around me being really tied into authenticity. That's my number one core value. But very few people that I work with, whether organizations or one-to-one with an entrepreneur or a leader, very few people are able to connect their behavior today to their top five or six core values. And so I wish people would ask me more questions about the uncovering of their own core values. Yes. And being able to find that blind spot, the stuff that they've been pulling from their past into the, to their now, that's really not letting them level up. That, that, that's awesome, man. Yeah. So <clears throat> what do you think makes a great coach then? Great coaching is all about, I think, two things, right? There's a lot of things, but it comes down to like two things for me. And number one is, is that a coach cannot let his or her own biases like interact with or bring any harm to the actual coachee or the protege. Right. So we have to make sure that we show up really objectively, number one. And that means our biases, our thought patterns, all of those things can't show up. Right. We're not meant to be mentors or counselors or consultants. We're meant to be coaches. So number two is that a coach asks really deep and really insightful questions. And they almost always start with how, what or why. And if as a coach, you remove your own bias, but then you ask phenomenal how, what or why questions. Now, all of a sudden, you're putting that person in a place to be able to express themselves safely. Absolutely, man. That, that, that's awesome. That, that's exactly what I wanted to hear. <laughs> that's how I run my coaching side. And that's just like, boom. me and you are just cut from the same. It must be the mitten thing, man. It is. So if I'm at a networking event, which here in South Florida, um, we're able to do a little press some flesh and meet some people masked up, of course, at least until sure. March 11th. Mm-hmm. But um, it, it, if, if I'm talking to somebody either virtually or in person, Michael, like what kind of things are they saying? They would, I would say, boom, Michael's a great, it'd be a great person to introduce to Michael as a prospect client or a connection. Yeah. So it, it really, for me is, is that if a person 
is at a point of disengagement, unhappiness. There's something going wrong at work that they're just not in tune with or that they feel that they're not living their core values each day or something about the, the interaction where they can't maybe express their own mission, right? They're not be able to be able to express themselves in that way. And so if those things are happening or if I'm seeing the patterns in that person, but there's also this desire to genuinely evolve and change, like they're at that precipice point of wanting to change and level up, that's where I can really step in or my book or my processes or my online courses, any of that stuff can help in, uh, jump in and be able to help them in a meaningful way. Awesome. And we will definitely make that warm introduction to you, Squad, if you want to meet Michael. I, I can't wait to to send some of you this his way because I know a lot of you, including myself, kind of need it as well. So, Michael, are you familiar with the movie Back to the Future? Yes. Okay. So let's get in that DeLorean with M Marty McFly. Let's go back to the 22-year-old Mr. Hospitality, you know, guy. Yep. What kind of knowledge nuggets, we call him here at Time to Shine today, what kind of knowledge nuggets are you dropping on Michael to maybe help him level up, last through, and shorten that learning curve a little bit? Man, oh, man. Oh, my gosh. It, Michael, at age 22, 23, was attempting to conquer the world in the way that I think my parents were going about attempting to conquer the world. And so I was constantly taking action, and I was constantly trying to achieve things. And if 40-year-old, because I'm 40 years old today, if I could turn back the clock today, to wow. that young okay. right? birthday. So. Well, my birthday is March 18th, so it's coming up pretty close, but nice. 40 today. Okay. And when I turn back the clock 18 or 19 years, I think about I was constantly trying to take action and I was constantly trying to achieve what someone else said was the path in life. And so if I could go back to that version of Michael and say, slow down, take a breath, go to the beach and hang out by the water for a bit and get really in tune with yourself because this constant action and activity is actually only going to bring you pain. And so like my first wife left me I got fired from a couple I'm of jobs. At that, but I'm, I'm, you're hitting everything. <laughs> <laughs> so when my wife left me and the jobs I got fired by, it was because I was attempting to live out someone else's versions of my life. And so I want to be able to go back to that younger version of myself and say, slow down and do the right things that are in alignment with your mission, your core values, your strengths, what makes you authentically you. That's where the game is. That's awesome. So you, you just said it, that you kind of pulled forward how you were, you know, lack of a better term, raised. You know, and, and you really would tell them to slow down. Would he have listened? At that time? No. No, well, neither. There's like I, a zero. I always say that. At least you're <laughs> honest, man. So how do you want Michael's dash remembered then? You know, that little line between your incarnation date and your expiration date, life date and death date. How do you want Michael's dash remembered? So for me, it really does come down to people are going to remember me for basically authenticity. Right. They're going to know me as the guy that can tell stories or has the right process or has the right resource that can help them get to the point of really understanding what I call their earth school curriculum. And so I think that all souls or all humans come to earth to learn something specifically. So I want people to remember me through whatever means are available as society goes through its transformations. I want people to know me as that if you go to Michael. Less Seaver, you'll be able to learn what makes you authentically you. You'll know your life's mission. You'll know your core values. You know your earth school curriculum, if you will. And if that happens, I would be incredibly happy. You know, you're like, you're, you're planting trees, bro. You're never going to sit in the shade of, you know what True. I'm saying? That's yeah. freaking amazing, man. Appreciate you yeah. doing that. Yeah. So what keeps Michael up at night? The thing that bothers me, uh, I think most nights is, is that there's that part of me that's still kind of connected back to the 22 year old version, which is. I have to constantly take action in order to be valued, appreciated, or successful. Yes. And so the thing that keeps me up at night is still wanting to do that, not as much as I used to in my early 20s, but I'm still trying to find a way to be happier with less. And that's hard, right? Yeah, is. Is that yeah, society yeah. tells us that more money and more success and more influence and all that stuff is appropriate. And in some cases, for some people, it is. But each of us has a different curriculum. And my curriculum is about kind of shedding that old mindset and welcoming in a slower pace of life. So if I could figure that out or do that, that would be huge. Do you do breath work? Yes. Okay. Yep. Gotcha. I, I was hoping yeah. you were going to say you do, because I am, that's my staple. I mean, you can live three weeks without food. Yeah. You can live a week without water, but breath, like maybe three minutes. It's like, I do that. Yeah. And I'm really getting into this kind of breathing to where I'm hitting the pelvic floor now. And it's, nice. it's amazing. That's really did a lot to change my life. Just, I had to ask that because it just seems like I'm getting that vibe that yeah. you do. So what do you think people misunderstand the most about Michael? 
Um, and so my partner, Tiffany, who we've been together about a year and a half today, she she says that the image that I'm able to project out into the community as being uh, a very astute, a very clear, uh, a very uh, pronounced, a, a very uh, strengths-based kind of like coach or person, that when I'm at home, I'm actually very relaxed, very funny, uh, very easygoing. And for some reason, I haven't been able to bring that necessarily out into the workplace yet. Yeah. And yes. so that's a that's work that I'm still trying to do. You're not, you know, it's not that hard. I'm not trying to coach you up, man, but I, I go you back can. to, there, I went back to a movie called Van Wilder. I don't know if you remember it. It was with Ryan Reynolds. It was yeah. it's actually one of the funnier National Lampoon movies. And there's a line in it that I live by. It says, don't take life too seriously. You'll never make it out alive. And it's like, dude, that's how I live. Even if I'm representing a client on a big real estate deal or something like that, then I'm on point. But other than that, dude, yeah. I am, I'm, I'm 6'1", I'm 265. I am the biggest goof that you ever freaking <laughs> meet. And that's where I really pulled that forward is I take nothing, nothing seriously, you know, unless it's detrimental to the family or sure. you know, obviously your bank account too, but no, I yep. appreciate you being transparent with that. Thank you. So what do you, what is Michael's definition of a life well lived? I think for me, as I go through the next 80 years, I think I got another 80 years on earth somehow. There you go, baby. Um, a life well lived for me is going to be okay with going at a slower pace or accepting life's challenges as they come without needing to control them or genuinely doing things every day that gift me energy, right? Like when you talk to Bob Berg on episode 200, right? It was very much about this idea that the more that we can give to other people coming from a place of true love and care for ourselves and for them, right? Then yes. all of a sudden we're in this environment where there's an ecosystem of people. And so I want to be at a good place for myself that I can uplift others. And then this entire ecosystem rises, if you will. Dude. Yeah. And that receptivity, if you're open to it, man, you just, it might not be monetary, but like I, I tell the story, man, my, my goddaughter really never calls me. I, I love her. And, but when she does, it's usually poppy for something, you know, but dude, I, I helped somebody out uh, and I was expecting nothing back just because that's the type of person they are. I love them, yeah. but, but Kelsey called me. And it was just like, dude, that's that open to receptivity. My goddaughter called me and it was just yeah. like, it, it was the best ever. That That's fantastic, man. Cool. I appreciate that. So we're going to wind things down just a little bit with our leveling up lightning round. And we're going to do that just as soon as we get back from thanking our sponsors and affiliates. All right, time to shine today. Podcast varsity squad. We are back with my good friend, Michael Seaver. Um, you can find him at michaelsseaver.com and all that st will be in the show notes. But right now, we're going to level up with Michael into our lightning round. Michael, listen, you and I could talk an hour, two hours on each one of these because you and I are like kindred, yeah. bro. So, <laughs> but you got five seconds with no explanation. Okay. You ready to rock? Let's do this. Let's do it. So, what's the best leveling up advice Michael's ever received? Everyone you interact with is a mirror of and for you. Wow. Wow. I, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm taking notes, dude. I'm breaking <laughs> my room. Awesome. So share one of your personal habits that contributes to your success. I do. You like yoga. I like 20 minutes of meditation as soon as I wake up. Love it, man. I do. I do the breathing. That's yeah. more of my meditation. I do kind of a Wim Hof or Troy Casey breathing. I love it. Right on. So other than your own website, michaelsseaver.com, and of course, time to shine today.com, my plug, shameless. Is there any what site do you go to to kind of level up, Michael? So I'm a member of the Forbes Coaches Council, nice. and, and so there are many other Forbes councils. And so for anybody looking for great information from people like Scott or I, one of the Forbes councils is undoubtedly going to have great insights. Love it. Love it. So I'm not feeling it, man. You notice my energy. You're like, Fergie, read this book. I'm in my doldrums read this book. What is it? For me, the book that really changed how I view my life was Loyalty to Your Soul by Ron and Mary yes. Holnick. Uh, yep. 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 Yes. Yes. It's a fantastic read. It's little well known. It should be a lot more well known. That's for sure. Agreed. man. So what's your most commonly used emoji when you text? <laughs> Probably the hug emoji. The hug? The huggy. <laughs> I love it. I love it. So it don't lie to me. So you obviously listened to Berg's interview, but like, don't lie to me on this one. Like, what age physically would you stay for the rest of your life if you could still keep the knowledge you've gained and garner more? What age physically? And don't lie, Michael. What is it? 
I mean, I'm 40 and I feel the best I've ever felt. Yeah, you know, I would, I say 32 just because it's a lot easier for me to get up and I'm, I'm going to be 50 and it's kind of like, you know, I, I would just take that 28 to 32 physically, but 40, if you look like you do, and that's, that, that's awesome. I'll go, I'll, I'll let you slide on that. So <laughs> what is your favorite charity and organization you like to give your time or money to? Right on big brothers, big sisters. Of, mm. And we're in my case, central Arizona. I love it. And I used to do that in, in the East side of Michigan there. And I love yeah. it. And I still, still write that check every year. And it's the best thing I can do. Yeah. Last question. You can elaborate a little bit. What's the yeah. best decade of music? 60s, 70s, 80s, or 90s? <laughs> Listen, I'm a child of the 1980s. So you get me an 80s rock or metal band and I'm, <laughs> I'm yours. <laughs> Bro, that whole decade, I always say <laughs> 80s too. And you know, I was born in 72, so I was able to kind of like see that, the, the 80s. And it's like, man, they had everything. I mean, you had the origins of rap. You yep. had, you, like you said, metal. And you had the glam rock, you know, with yep. Poison and whatnot. You had the hair, all the other hair bands, Big Hair, Don't Care kind of stuff. And then you had the U2 Irish Invasion. You had Duran Duran with the English in, or Australian Invasion. It's like, dude, everything yep. happened in the 80s. It was the best decade to be alive. Today. Ever. It Ever. Was, it was amazing. I got my driver's license. I'm sure they didn't <laughs> like it, but you know, and I graduated in 1990. So like that whole eighties was my jam. So yeah. Michael, how can we find your brother? You said it a couple of times already, Scott, Michael S is the, the best place. You can learn a lot about online courses or the book that I just published called. I know uh, I have a bunch of blogs. I have my own podcast. And so lots of good information there for sure. I love it. And we're going to put all of that in the show notes. And I'm going to drop this in Michael's subconscious. I want to come on a show. Anyway, <laughs> this is my shameless plug, baby. So, Michael, leave us with one last knowledge you nugget know, you want us to take with us, internalize yeah. and take action on. The, the thing, I think that the theme of your and my conversation, somewhat unknowingly, but it has been really powerful, has been be the person you needed when you were younger. And that to me is so profound in so many ways, in that each of us in our younger years has some sort of a challenge that we endure around age 27, 28, 29, we overcome the challenge. And then the highest and best use of our life for the next 20 years from like age 30 to 50 is to help other people overcome that same challenge that we had for themselves. So I love be the that. person. Be that person. It's like mentoring, right? In a, yeah. in a sense. I mean, like they, my mentor used to say, you know, the more you mentor, the more immortal you become. You know, yeah. so that, that that's that, that's just amazing, Michael. I really appreciate you sharing that. And squad, you've just gotten like a legit masterclass with my good friend from the mitt, Michael Siever from MichaelSiever.com. dot com. Mm-hmm. You know, he he is all about kind of staying steps ahead, but he does it in a way of care, and he wants to like anticipate, but not give you the answers. He want, he's really asking those powerful questions to pull you forward. You know, he wants you to kind of beginning with the recognize what you learn from your birth to age six, identify those patterns, either through a pain journal or a gratitude journal. And Michael can really, really, you know, help you with that. You know, ask your coach, if you're going to hire one, which we hope it's Michael with his authenticity, but ask their coach about their core values. What really means to them? You know, and he, a great coach does not let, was it uh, like the busyness show up? You know, they'll ask powerful, deep questions, the how, what, and why. You know, he's disengaged, unhappy, core values. Intru- if you're feeling that way, disengaged, unhappy, and your core values are just out of whack, let us make a warm introduction into Michael. They help you evolve and change into what that, that better person that you really know is underneath those layers. You know, he would tell himself, to slow down when he was younger. And like we say, then we pull from the great coach, John Wooden, be quick, but don't hurry, you know, really be ready. And that means just be mindful. And Michael's going to be remembered for this authenticity, you know, and his, his life well lived is it's okay to live at that slower pace and do the things and the gifts that give you energy. And this one just rocked my world. And it's going to go into my quotes of my life is be the person you need when you're younger, man, be that mentor for somebody, whether you're making money or not, you can give a little And Michael is so humble yet. He's hungry. He levels up his health. He levels up his wealth. He's so transparent. We appreciate that. You've earned your time to shine today. Varsity squad letter. And thank you so much, brother. So grateful. Thank you. Talk soon, Michael. Bye now.